And as we look to our God and we see his unchangeableness, if we're growing in Christ, then we too should be less in the mode of changing and moving and more in the mode of remaining steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. And I don't know about you, I don't want to be a, used to be a soul winner, used to be a Baptist, used to be a preacher, used to be a husband, used to be this. I want to be found faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. None of these things will move me. Take your Bible tonight, if you would, please, and turn to the book of Acts, chapter 20. Acts, chapter 20, for our scripture reading time. And I do hope that you will pray for Spiritual Leadership Asia Conference. We have now registered delegates from over 51 countries, and they're coming to Manila. And frankly, they need to hear the stories like the story of this church. I received an email just before the service from 27 people boarding a flight from India, and yesterday from several coming from Pakistan, many from Vietnam and Cambodia, they have never seen a church like this raised up in their country. And I believe that the Word of God will help us to form a philosophy whereby the 1040 window will abound again and again with ministries like this, should the Lord tarry in His coming. So pray for the conference that God will bless it and use it in a wonderful way. We have over 100 of our members traveling from California to be here, and there's a lot of prayer going into the meeting. I hope you'll pray with us that God will bless in a great, great way. In a moment, we're going to read Acts 20, and we've already read the passage, but I'd like to just read my key text to you from verse number 24. We just got in last night from Korea, and I was preaching there on Friday night to a pastor's fellowship, and what I have learned, Brother Bonte, in these last few years about traveling because with COVID and just everything going on, people are a little touchy and uh, nervous, and, uh, and, and you have to learn when you travel to be nice to everybody. Be very patient. Be very calm. I heard about a man that was uh, leaving the airport in Los Angeles, and he was standing in the line, and as he was standing there, the man in front of him was being very mean and belligerent to the uh, airline worker. He was cursing and just raising his voice, and finally, he got out of the way, and the man behind him stepped up to the counter, and he said to the airline worker, he said, how in the world do you put up with people like that? And the man behind the counter said, oh, you mean that guy that was just here? It's easy. He's going to Hong Kong, but his bags are going to Seoul. <laughs> and I've found it's much better just to be nice to people, and they'll be nice back to you. And so we're glad to be here safely. We got in late last night, and uh, we're excited about this week. Acts 20, 24, the Bible says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. I want to speak tonight on this subject, none of these things move me. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the great heritage of this church, for the faithful pastor and pastor's wife and family, and for the dear people who've been here for many years. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless and may many more thousands of souls come to know Christ through this ministry. But Lord, we now pray that you would speak to our hearts, fill us with your spirit, give us what we need from your word, strengthen us for the week ahead, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Paul wrote to a young preacher named Timothy, and he said to Timothy, in the last days, perilous times will come. The word perilous means unraveling. Paul was telling Timothy, Timothy, in the last days, there's going to be an unraveling from the top to the bottom. Things are going to seemingly fall apart. And we have certainly seen that in our country and in this part of the world as well. We're seeing families that are unraveling, and we're seeing many times churches that are unraveling. We're seeing people that once stood firm on doctrinal positions beginning to move away, and sometimes Christians that were faithful in their church for decades who become less and less involved, and people that once gave to missions, and people that once carried gospel tracts, and suddenly they're not as faithful as they once were. 
There are many reasons that people would give for this, but the fact is that there is an unraveling happening in the world spiritually around us today. Now, the Apostle Paul certainly understood that, and in fact, here at the end of Paul's third missionary journey, the Bible records for us in the book of Acts that he called unto himself the elders uh, of the church at Ephesus. He gathered the pastors together in a place not far from Ephesus, off the Aegean Sea, uh, called Miletus. And there they had a pastor's meeting, and Paul was challenging them and recounting with them his three years of ministry there in Ephesus. And as he's speaking about the ministry, he reminded them in verse 20 how he kept back nothing that was profitable to them, but how he showed them and had taught them publicly and from house to house. By the way, thank God for soul winning publicly and from house to house. He had been faithful. He had been testifying to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. But then he says in verse 22, Behold, now I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. He's letting them know that he would be moving from them and going to another place of ministry. And and he says in verse 22, I don't know exactly what will happen there, uh, except that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide in me. And then we come to verse 24, and we find this phrase, But none of these things move me. Do you know every once in a while it's important to make up your mind and to determine that nothing will move you from your convictions of standing true on the Word of God. No matter how much unraveling comes, no matter how many trials come into your life, Paul said, I don't know what will happen when I go to Jerusalem, but I know this, I will not let anything move me from the faith that God has placed in my heart. None of these things will move me. Now, I don't know how Satan is tempting you to move tonight. I don't know if he's trying to get you to stop serving in some way, if he's trying to get you out of soul winning or maybe out of serving God. I think of all of the various congregations joining with us online tonight. We've enjoyed watching you from uh, the UAE and from different parts of the world. It's been fun to, to think of you worshiping God with us tonight. But I can tell you that many of these who are in far and remote places like this, it is not always easy to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan does not want us in church on a Sunday night. He does not want us holding uh, to the infallibility of the Word of God or to the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want us carrying gospel tracts. He would be very happy if every preacher in this room just walked away from the ministry and stopped preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some people don't necessarily move theologically, but their spirit changes. Have you ever seen someone like that? At one time they were sweet and joyful in the Lord and then some bitterness comes into their heart, maybe some envy, maybe some covetousness. You know, the devil doesn't really care how you move. He just wants you to move away from close fellowship to God and faithful service to God. And Paul said, before I go to Jerusalem, I've already made up the decision. None of these things are going to move me away from serving my God. Sometimes it's important in our lives that we make decisions and just come back to a place of saying, Lord, you've been so good in saving me. By your grace, I'm not going to move away from the things that you have given to me. I want you to notice tonight in this simple verse, three things the Apostle Paul tells us he will not allow to move him. I believe all of us can learn from each of these. I want you to notice, first of all, he tells us in this passage, people won't move me. I'm not going to let people move me away from the will of God. Now notice in verse 18, to understand this, he says, And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews." When you study the life of the Apostle Paul, you find that everywhere he went, there were people lying in wait to push him back, 
to tell lies about him, to throw stones against him. Uh, oftentimes we read about Paul's life in difficulty. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten with rods. He was bitten by snakes. He was thrown into prison. It just seemed like everywhere he went, uh, there was some kind of a group that was spreading some lies about him on the first missionary journey as he went out preaching in Derba, Derby and Lystra and various different cities about. Uh, there were those Jews that went ahead of him spreading gossip and lies and doing all that they could to push him back. But Paul said, I'm not going to let people move me. We notice in the text tonight in verse 19, he speaks of the lying in wait of the Jews. Acts 9 and 23, the Bible says, and after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Acts 14, 19, and there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, threw him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. In the Christian life, we will often face people from without who are not friendly towards our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes it will even come from within. Christians that do all they can to discourage you with their jealous remarks or their cutting remarks. And, and yet Paul said, I'm not going to let people stop me from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. What did he do? The Bible tells us that he continued serving. He continued serving, just as we sang a moment ago about serving Jesus. Verse 19 says, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. Hey, there is joy in serving Jesus. And Paul said, I will not let them stop me from serving the Lord Jesus Christ. He continually served because his focus was on the Lord. Notice that in verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. Friend, if you're serving for your spouse, it won't last long. If you're serving just to please others, it won't last long. Oh, you have a wonderful pastor, and, and you ought to encourage him and, and love him in the Lord for his work's sake. But if you just do what you do for the preacher, it won't last as long as it should. But if you're serving the Lord, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, you'll be faithful no matter what people say about you. No matter what people do to you. And we see here the apostle Paul was serving. I love his testimony in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. He says, we were gentle among you even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing not to have imparted unto you the gospel of God only, but our own souls because you were dear unto us. Paul poured his life out as a drink offering on the altar of sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't just reading a lesson and going home. He wasn't just preaching his sermon and saying, I'm out of here. He wasn't just doing his duty. He was pouring his life into serving God, and he said, I will not let people stop me or move me from doing what God has called me to do. What a tremendous testimony. Serving the Lord with all humility. Serving the Lord, he says, with compassion, with many tears. Verse 31 says, I cease not to warn every one of you night and day with tears. Paul the apostle continued serving and he continued sowing the gospel. Notice in verse 20 the Bible says, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Oh, in the city of Ephesus there were different kinds of neighborhoods like we have here in Manila. There were some that were more affluent, some that were less affluent. But the Apostle Paul did not choose just one single area. He went to every area. He went publicly. He went from house to house preaching the word of God. Listen, the only alternative to soul winning is disobedience. And here was a man who would not disobey God in the matter of soul winning. He would go out telling others about Jesus Christ. I was out at the hospitals a few months ago, and I was talking to a man uh, who had visited our church, and he was in the hospital bed, and it was one of those hospital beds that had just like a curtain between the different patients, and I was talking with him about accepting Christ as Savior. And for some reason, as I was talking to him, I, I used the phrase, being washed in the blood. I said, if we're sinners, I said, Jesus died and shed his blood, and when we're washed in the blood by accepting Jesus as Savior, then our sins are washed away, and we have a home in heaven. And I was talking with him about being washed in the blood and what it meant to be saved. By the way, how many of you are thankful you're washed in the blood tonight? Amen. And I went through the process of trying to lead the man to Christ, and he just would not pray. He just would not accept Christ. Sometimes we witness, and people don't respond the way we hope. I was a little discouraged. I, I walked 
out of the room. I started to walk out and go to the hallway. And as I was walking, the man in the bed next to him on the other side of the curtain, he said something to me I've never heard someone say before. He said, I want to be washed in the blood. I turned around and I looked at him. I said, excuse me? He said, I heard what you were telling that man. He said, I need to be washed in the blood of Jesus. And about five minutes later, he prayed and accepted Christ as his Savior. Don't let your discouragement with one person keep you from telling the next person about Jesus Christ. Paul said, none of these things will move me. I will not let people move me. He went publicly. He went from house to house. And his message in verse 21 was repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. They're the fruit of the work of the Holy Spirit of God who convicts us of our sin and shows us our need for the Savior. And Paul the apostle was challenging men and women to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, to trust in his God gospel message. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you and which ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. How many of you are thankful that the gospel really is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? Christ. Oh, tonight Paul went from place to place preaching that death, burial, and resurrection. Sometimes when you're out soul winning, it might be discouraging. I knocked on a door several years ago, and a man came to the door. He was a Filipino man. I began to speak to him briefly about attending church. I shared a few things about the gospel, and he slammed the door right in my face. I have a very high opinion of the Filipino culture as being polite and kind. That's normally what you expect, but not that day. Boom. He said, as the door was closing, he said, we're Catholic. Boom, the door shut like that. I thought, wow. And I walked away somewhat dejectedly, and I went to the next house, the next house. And that next Sunday, I was standing out in the lobby of our church after I preached and shaking hands, and a man came up to me and had his wife with him. They were very sharply dressed. And I shook his hand. He said, do you remember me? I said, no, sir, I, I, I can't remember you. People ask me that question, but I can't always remember everybody. And he said, well, do you remember being over in Palmdale and you knocked on someone's door and the door got slammed in your face? I said, it's coming back to me. I remember that. He put his head down. He said, Pastor Chapel. he said, I'm not a Catholic. He said, my wife and I were saved in an independent Baptist church in Manila. He said, but we never got baptized and we've been horribly backslidden and we wanna come and we would ask you if you would be willing to baptize us here at Lancaster Baptist Church. Well, we baptized them and a few weeks later we had our spiritual leadership conference. God began to move on his heart. God did a wonderful work in his heart and got him involved in doing some missions work. And I'm so thankful today that even though the door was slammed, God didn't stop working in the man's heart. Oh, friend, don't let people discourage you from doing what God has called you to do. Paul said, none of these things move me. People will not move me. Notice, secondly, he says, problems will not move me. Notice in verse 22, and now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. He said, I don't know what's going to happen in my next ministry uh, at Jerusalem. Uh, he said, I know that bonds and afflictions seem to abide in me. When I became pastor at Lancaster Baptist Church nearly 36 years ago, I did not know. Your pastor did not know. We were both talking earlier about how we thought when we were young preachers, what would it be like someday to have 100 people in church? We both thought that would be unimaginable. I remember telling Terry that. Wouldn't it be something if we had 100 people? God has been so good. I did not know 36 years ago that we would have picketers sometime picket our church and say, this is a false church. Pastor Chapel, don't listen to Pastor Chapel. We've had one guy lately with the bullhorn standing out there yelling at people as they come to church. That's how he's trying to get some followers for himself. I didn't know we'd have that. 
I didn't know something called the internet would come and there'd be bloggers with complaints. I didn't know uh, so many people would get cancer and I didn't know we'd have so many funerals. I didn't know we'd have sometimes uh, various different death threats that would even come. I didn't know all the problems that we would have in ministry, but I can testify to you tonight that with God's calling comes God's enabling and God's grace is always sufficient. Paul said, I'm not going to let problems stop me. We had one fellow that was picketing our church several years ago, and he had some friends, and they were walking on the sidewalk. We had paid for the sidewalk, but then we gave it to the city. We couldn't kick them off because of free speech. And he would walk with these signs, and Paul Chapel is a false prophet. Don't listen to the preaching, things like this. It's uh, quite discouraging when you have people doing that, and you're inviting visitors. I didn't know what to do. I, I told our staff, we had a staff meeting on Monday. I said, all right, here's what I want you to do. Take the sprinklers. In, in California where we live, we don't have rain. They had some yesterday. They had snow. But we have very little rain. I said, uh, take the sprinklers. We have to sprinkle all of our water to keep it growing. And I said, instead of pointing the sprinklers to the grass, turn the sprinklers on the sidewalk. <laughs> and so we did that one Sunday. And they walked through the, they walked through the uh, sprinklers. But it didn't stop them. They just kept going back and forth. So we had another staff meeting. I said, all right, here's what I want you to do. I said to the youth pastor, I want you to go to the costume shop and get a costume of a devil. I want you to wear the costume of a devil with a pitchfork and a tail and horns, and I want you to make a sign that says, I'm with him, and I want you to follow that guy all the way around, back and forth. And that frustrated him, and they finally left. <laughs> Who would have ever thought the types of things we deal with in the ministry today. Now, why was it that Paul did not quit? Why was it that problems would not move him? I want to show you a reason or two why. Verse 22. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. I want you to notice the word bound. It's in the passive voice. It indicates that Paul did not bind himself but that he was under the binding of another, that which would be the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, he was God called, Holy Spirit bound. He wasn't mama called and papa sent. This was a man that knew God had called him to preach. He knew that there was an unction on his life. He was bound in the spirit to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts 23 and verse 11. And the night following the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so thou must bear witness also at Rome. We need more preachers tonight who are bound in the spirit to preach the gospel and deacons who are bound in the spirit to be a soul winner and Sunday school teachers who are not just going through the curriculum, but they're bound in their spirit to teach the children the word of God. He was bound by the Lord to be faithful. Oh, tonight we need men and women who are bound. But notice also he was burdened. The Bible tells us in verse 22, Now I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. I want you to see this phrase there, I go bound in the Spirit. Acts 18 and verse 5 tells us, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. This was a spiritual burden on his heart. Oh, tonight let me encourage you. Don't let people rob you from your spiritual burden. Sometimes I see preachers, they just stop caring. I see Christians, they, they've been hurt. They've been burned. They've had their experience. And they're kind of down on Christianity. We had a fellow that came to our church, he and his family, for a few years, and they would never get baptized. And finally, I, I saw them come forward, and they came to present themselves for baptism, and they got baptized. And after church, I said, what made you finally decide to get baptized? They said, well, they said, uh, we've been burned in our last church. We had a bad experience. And I said, well, I'm sorry about that. But they said, well, we just wanted to watch you and your church and said, in fact, I'm your mailman. He said, for the last two years, I have looked at every piece of mail that I put into your mailbox. We've just been watching you. He said, in fact, my wife has been following your wife at Walmart just to see what she puts 
in the shopping basket. Now, fellas, that's a full-time job. I'm telling you, that is a full-time job to do that. He said, we've just been watching you. You know, maybe you're listening to me tonight and you've been hurt. Maybe someone has disappointed you. Can I just encourage you? Don't take two years off from serving God. Don't let people move you from doing what you know is right to do. Many times people get sidetracked. They get bitter. And yet Jesus, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion upon them. I I see in the Apostle Paul this testimony. None of these things move me. He said, I'm not going to let people move me from doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm not going to let problems move me from doing what I'm supposed to do. But then I want you to see thirdly tonight. He said, I'm not going to let pride move me from doing what I'm supposed to do. Pride move me from doing what I'm supposed to do. Now notice this, really the heart of this message in verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Now notice a very important phrase in this verse, verse 24. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Let's say that together. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Now often when you start serving God, you have an awe for God. It's awesome. You're so overwhelmed that you can sing in the choir. You're so overwhelmed that you're in ministry. You're so privileged to preach. There's this awe of God. He's high and holy. He is awesome. But over time, the idol of self is ever present. And self begins to think, what do I get out of this? Why did she sing and not me? Why did he get that church, not me? Why did that person have this blessing and not me? And sometimes we have to face the fact that the greatest danger to our ministry is ourselves. The single greatest thing that will knock you out of the ministry is you yourself. And Paul takes an accounting of himself. And he says to us in this verse, none of these things move me. Neither, notice this phrase, count I my life dear unto myself. He uses an accounting term and he says, sometimes I have to reckon with this. I I have to realize the ministry's not about me. It doesn't matter if I'm noticed. It doesn't matter if I'm applauded. It doesn't matter what I get out of the ministry. I have decided that neither count I my life dear unto myself. Herein lies sometimes my greatest problem and perhaps yours as well. That is, that we think more highly of ourselves than we should. We we don't think we should have to have that trial. We don't think people should treat us that way. Don't they know who we are? And the reason many times people move and compromise theologically or quit in the ministry is because we begin to think we deserve something more out of it. But Paul teaches us a valuable lesson when he says, neither count I my life Dear unto myself, notice here, first of all, he did not value his will over God's ministry. He did not value his will over God's ministry. It's very clear when you read verse 24 that he says, I I, I don't count my life dear unto myself. I just want to finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. By the way, how many of you want to hear those words someday? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. The idol of self will rob you from receiving those rewards from Jesus Christ. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. The only hope of a decreasing self is an increasing Christ. We must see him as high and lifted up. We must see his example and live according to it. Pride many times is the root of compromise. Many times when we think highly of ourselves, we're willing to make compromise that we should not have made. Let me say tonight that the men and women who have changed this world are the men and women the world could not change. People who were firmly convicted 
on the word of God. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. Listen, when we count our lives dear unto ourselves, we want to be accepted by the crowd. Hey, that's why churches today are dropping their standard about marriage and dropping their standard on the LBGTQ and finding themselves involved in all kinds of condoning of sinful practices and compromising the truth of the word of God. Why? They want to be popular with the world, but I'm here to tell you today that we must not allow ourselves becoming full of pride to compromise the doctrines of the word of God. The world may reject us, but we must be true to God. Pride is often the reason that compromise comes in our lives and in our church. Pride is often the root of contention. It's the reason that Christians can't get along. Sometimes there's smokescreen issues and people want to create those issues and there are certainly legitimate reasons for separating perhaps from another Christian, but many times what I find is that it's mostly about pride and personality. Paul says here in verse number 24, he says, I don't count myself so dear. I don't take myself so seriously. You know, it's probably a good idea once in a while that we can laugh at ourselves. It's good that we recognize it's not all about us. In London, England, in the late 1800s, there was the ministry of Dr. Charles Spurgeon. Pastor Spurgeon had the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle. And of course, probably the most prolific preacher and writer of his time. There was another pastor at the same time in London by the name of Pastor Parker. Well, one day there was a comment Pastor Parker made in his sermon. It was not really a prepared comment, just a side comment. And he said something about Charles Spurgeon's orphanages. They weren't real clean and organized, some, some side remark. And, oh, that got back to Charles Spurgeon. And that next Sunday, Charles Spurgeon preached against Pastor Parker and just let him have it. That's before the internet. You had to wait seven days to rip somebody. It had to take some time. Nowadays, it's just before the service is over. Boy, Charles Spurgeon just preached about Pastor Parker. Well, of course, all of the newspapers and all of the gossips, they went to Pastor Parker's church the next week. They wanted to hear what he said about Charles Spurgeon. This was going to be good. And Pastor Parker said, I understand that Pastor Spurgeon's church is having an offering today for their orphanage. And I want us to take the offering baskets and pass the offering baskets and take an offering for Pastor Spurgeon's orphanages. In fact, they passed the offering baskets three times. Monday morning, Pastor Parker and his deacons carried six bags of money. And they took the money to Pastor Spurgeon and they said, we appreciate your ministry and we're for you. And this is the offering we took for your orphanages. And Spurgeon looked at Pastor Parker and said, Parker, you have practiced grace on me. How many of you believe we need to practice more grace on one another? Neither count our lives dear unto ourselves. A Spurgeon could have gotten angry and stayed angry, and Parker could have gotten angry and stayed angry, but they came to the place where the Apostle Paul was. They said, look at we don't want to be moved from our main cause of reaching souls, and I'm not going to count my life dear unto myself. Many times, pride is the root of contention. Proverbs 13 and verse 10, only by pride cometh contention. Paul did not value his will over God's ministry. Paul did not value himself over getting the gospel message out. Notice in verse 24 again, he says, uh, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Listen, this is what God had called him to do there on the road to Damascus. This is what God had equipped him to do with Ananias and through the training that he received. And when God saved you, he had a purpose for your life and that is that you would share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we see in this message, the Bible tells us that Paul did not want to get away from testifying of the gospel of the grace of God. He tells us in Philippians 3 and verse 5, he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss, for Christ. 
Yea, doubtless, I counted all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. So the fact of the matter is sometimes people discourage us, and sometimes problem comes, and sometimes our pride uh, kind of eats away within our heart. But then when you take a fresh look at the cross, and then when you remember what Jesus Christ did for you and how the Roman soldiers put the nails through his hands and through his feet and how the crown was placed upon his brow and how every drop of that blood was shed for your sin and for my sin and you realize the suffering. You think of the sponge full of vinegar placed into his mouth and you think of the sword that pierced his side and the spear as it came and you think of all of the agony of the cross of Jesus Christ and then you say, you know, it doesn't matter what people are saying and it doesn't matter what problems may come my way and it doesn't really matter if I'm filling up with a little pride. I, what matters is that Jesus loves me and I want to serve him faithfully. Paul said, I'm not going to let anything move me. I don't know what's going to happen at Jerusalem, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. I don't know everything there is to know about being a pastor. Your pastor has been married 46 years. We've been married 42 Pastor's been at this church a long time, but I know this. More than once, the devil's tried to tell him, why don't you just check out of this? You don't need all this. More than once, the devil's tried to say, just step out of the ministry and stop preaching the gospel. I want to tell you something. The devil's going to try to push you out from being where God wants you to be. And I want to challenge you tonight to simply say, Lord Jesus, by your grace, none of these things will move me. I'm not going to let what people say move me. I'm not going to let the problems that come my way move me from being a faithful soul winner, a faithful giver to missions, a faithful servant. I'm not going to let my own pride, my hurt feelings cause me to quit. And that's why many people quit. None of these things move me. I don't know about you tonight, but I'm thankful that I serve an unchanging God. He's not like me. He's not like you. He doesn't have a temperament that's so up and down and so easily heard and so melancholic. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3 and verse 6. I am the Lord. I change not. Thank God for his immutability. And as we look to our God and we see his unchangeableness, if we're growing in Christ, then we too should be less in the mode of changing and moving and more in the mode of remaining steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. And I don't know about you. I don't want to be a used to be a soul winner, used to be a Baptist, used to be a preacher, used to be a husband, used to be this. I want to be found faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. None of these things will move me. One day soon the Lord Jesus will return. The Bible tells us the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. The trump of God will sound first. Oh, listen, there is coming a day when that trump will sound. The dead in Christ will rise. We that are alive and remain will join them in the air. I don't know about you. I believe that day is coming very, very soon. And I don't want to be on a quitter's bench when that trumpet sounds. I want to be found faithful to Jesus when that trumpet sounds. One of our missionaries is serving the Lord over in Romania. And I was preaching there several years ago. And there's a man in the church named Dan Garva. And I began to talk to Dan about his testimony. He, his testimony intrigued me. He had one leg completely sawn off. And he came to church in crutches each night during the revival meeting. I said, tell me your story. He said, well, Pastor Chapel, Romania was a communist land. We had a communist dictator who hated Christianity. He oppressed us. He said he especially hated Baptist people because we're freedom-loving people and Christ-loving people. And he said there was a time when we were not really allowed to say anything, of course, about the government. We were not allowed to say anything about Jesus. But he said, I got some of my friends from our youth group, and we decided that we would just do a prayer vigil where we would light candles and we would walk around the city square of the city of Temeshwara and we would just pray. And that's what they did. They lit candles, several dozen of them. They just walked around 
first night, there was no problem. The second night, no one knows exactly how it happened, but some soldiers from the rooftops of the buildings in the city square of Timishwara began to shoot at the teenagers. And as they began to shoot, several of them began to fall. Many of them were injured. One of them that was injured was Dan. It was two or three days later before his pastor could get up to the hospital, and he came to the hospital to visit Dan, and by that time, Dan's leg had been completely amputated because of the bullet wounds he had suffered. pastor looked at his church member, and he said, Oh, Dan, I'm so sorry you lost your leg. And Dan looked up at his pastor and said, Pastor, don't be sorry. I was able to light the first candle. Let me tell you something. Satan wants to blow your candle out. Paul the apostle said, none of these things will move me. I will be faithful to my Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know how your candle's doing tonight, but let me encourage you to let it keep shining. You remember that song, don't you? This little light of mine. Know that song? Sing it with me. This little light of mine. Wait a minute. You do not have your candle in the air. Pastor had you singing with your hand up and moment goes, so let's sing it together as we close. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Then won't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. None of these things move me. People won't move me. Problems won't push me out. My own pride. I'll come to the cross and humble myself before my children don't have a daddy in church. I'll be faithful by the grace of God. I don't know how Satan's pushing you tonight. I just know he's pushing you. And I want to encourage you to say tonight, none of these things will move me. Let's stand together, shall we? Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you tonight for the privilege of serving you and sometimes, Lord, there's discouragements that come. Sometimes it's people problems. Somebody says something. Somebody's critical. Sometimes it's problems of persecution. And sometimes, Lord, it's just our own pride. We feel sorry for ourselves. And yet we hear the apostle saying, none of these things move me. Lord, I pray that you'd help somebody tonight to determine I will not be moved away from the center of the will of God. I will not be moved away from serving my Lord. Our heads are bowed tonight. Our eyes are closed. I wonder how many of you would say, Brother Chapel, there's been something pushing against me. I've, I have felt people pushing against me. There's been some problems with some relatives or friends or people at work that don't appreciate your faith. How many of you would say, Brother Chapel, by the grace of God, I will not let those people push me away from serving Jesus. God is my helper. They will not move me. If God spoke to you on that first point, would you lift your hand tonight? I'd like to pray for you. I'm not going to let people push me away. I won't let them do it. Sometimes they might try to say things to discourage you. God bless you. How many of you would say, Brother Chapel, sometimes it's the problems and I have some trials. It's problems at work. It's problems in, in, in health and difficulty. And the devil's just been saying, why don't you just quit? And I wonder tonight who'd say, on that second point, I need to make a decision. This problem will not move me away from serving my God. If God spoke to you on that second point, let me pray with you. Would you lift your hand? Who's there tonight? Say, God spoke to me right there. I'm not going to let that problem stop me from serving him. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. And then finally, is there someone that would be honest enough simply to say tonight, you know, Brother Chapel, sometimes it's just my pride. I just think I shouldn't have to be treated this way. I just feel like I deserve better. And I just begin to have self-pity. And I'm realizing I'm my own worst enemy at that point. 
And Paul said, I'm not going to think more highly of myself than I should. Mm -hmm. Brother Chapel, you've reminded us tonight that we're just sinners saved by grace. Yeah. And who's here tonight? You'd say, Brother Chapel, pray with me that I'll humble myself before the Lord and stop thinking highly of myself to the point of discouraging myself. Would you lift your hand if God spoke to you on the third point? Yeah. I want to pray for you there. Father, thank you for these who've listened so well tonight. As pastor comes and conducts this invitation, Lord, would you help us tonight to obey your still small voice? If there's someone here tonight without Christ as their Savior, Lord, would you help them to know and to understand that you did die for them, that they might have forgiveness, that they might be washed in the blood, and that they might have a home in heaven. And then I want to pray for those that have had some people problems lately, people just saying and hurting them, others who've had trials, others who've had to battle within themselves with pride. Father, give them victory tonight. And may they be in your house a year from now and a decade from now, should you tarry, because they determined none of these things will move me. Let this night be a mile marker night in their life where they determine that they will not quit because of this trial. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother. You know, God spoke to my heart. Speak about discouragement, despondency, disillusionment, pride, all of those things, folks. Paul had the two. Do you know what he said? None of these things move me. Amen. You're right, Pastor Chapel. How many times I said I'm going to quit? Yep. We get tired, isn't it? I get scared at times. People think that, pro the peop that pastors don't have any problem at all because they preach dynamically. But we have problems too. Been preaching for 54 years, folks. Pastoring for 47 years. I'm still here. By the grace of God. Amen. None of these things move me. Thank you. You may come forward if you want to and talk to your God tonight. Come to the altar if you want.